right, so how many of you guys have ever had a, a conversation that you, you knew needed to happen, um, but it was going to be a tough conversation? Um, and, and maybe it, was gonna, it had some awkward topics, it had something that you didn't really want to bring up. Um, it was going to be hard. There was going to be some conflict, right? Um, well, if you've ever had a conversation like that, it can be kind of you're, you're dreading coming up to that, that point or that person. Um, but more often than not, it's, it's a lot easier to just jump right in and just, just say it, right? You kind of just jump right in, you, you lay the facts on the table, and you just start moving forward. You just start talking, right? Um, well, that's essentially what Paul is doing here, and uh, we're going we're gonna to follow his, his, uh, his words here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tonight. Um, we do have it up on the U version if you guys are, are wanting to, to do that, um, but go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to start here with the first couple verses. Verse 1, it says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So this, this kind of brings us to our first point, which is discipline for repentance. Um, now, at this point in the passage, we're just on the discipline point. Um, and Paul just jumps right in. It, it's, a, it's a quick change of, of pace from chapter 4 to, to chapter 5. And he jumps right in and he says, It is actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you. Um, and he doesn't mince words. He just jumps right in. He says, A man has his father's wife. And uh, we, we don't know many details beyond this. And honestly, it's kind of a good thing that we don't. Um, but it's, it's probably likely that this was uh, this man's stepmother. Um, and so then he says that this is not even tolerated among the pagans. So this type of sexual immorality, essentially what he's saying, isn't even tolerated among unbelievers that, you, that are, you're around with. Um, and for instance, this was actually uh, even against uh, Roman law. And so this was something that just was not done, even among unbelievers. Um, and, and then, so he addresses this issue here. Um, it's a, a case of incest, for lack of a better, a better way of saying it. Um, and, and what's interesting, though, is in, in verse 2 he says, And you are arrogant... And so he's actually addressing the church of Corinth um, more than he's even addressing the person involved or the persons involved in this, um, this issue. And the you in chapter 2 is uh, plural. And so he's saying, you are arrogant, ought you not rather to mourn? And so the issue here is, is there's sexual immorality in the church. And not only is it in the church, but it's also apparently well known. Because um, Paul didn't get on Facebook and, and be scrolling down, oh, I wonder how the Corinthian church is going, uh, click on their page. What? Who's with who? That's not how things worked back then. See, like, word had traveled city to city or from person to person all the way back to Paul. So this was not a secret sin. This wasn't something that they were pushing under the rug. Um, it was reported all the way back to Paul, and apparently they weren't even ashamed of it says, you are arrogant. Another way to say this is puffed up, prideful about this. And so this kind of begs the question, what is going on here in the Corinthian church, right? Have you guys ever read uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2? And it says, uh, Paul poses this kind of ridiculous question. He says, uh, should you go on sinning so that grace may increase? And he says, by no means, right? He answers his own incredulous question. And uh, I, I sometimes I'll read through that passage and I'll be like, you know, what, what kind of a situation is Paul talking about here? You know, this seems pretty basic, right? As Christians, we shouldn't keep sinning just so that there's more grace because that's completely contradictory to what we've been given grace for, right? And we've been saved from sin, not so that we can keep sinning more. But I think that's the type of situation that, that Paul was speaking to in Romans. Should you go on sinning? By no means. But the Corinthians had a, a, clearly they had a messed up view of grace, so much to the point that it was, uh, that they were, they were proud of licentiousness. They were using grace as a license to do whatever they want because God's grace is covering us. That's essentially what is happening here. Moving into verse three, it says, for though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. And so Paul is essentially saying, hey, as your spiritual father, as, as your spiritual authority here, I've already pronounced judgment on this person. I don't need to come here. And so he's, he's jumping into the execution of what type of discipline needs to happen and what kind of discipline the church needs to enact on this person. Verse 4, when you are assembled in my name, 
or when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And so this is where we get to the, the kind of the point of repentance as well. So discipline for repentance. That's, that's, that's the point that Paul is making here. And when we look at verse 5, he says, you know, excommunicate this person from the church. It says, deliver him to Satan so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So Paul is clearly, clearly saying what the intent of discipline, what the end goal of church discipline is here. It is for repentance so that somebody can come back. Um, one thing that is interesting in verse 4 is he says, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, um, he, he says that's when uh, the discipline should take pay, place, so in, in front of the assembly. Um, now this kind of brings up to note not every sin uh, needs to be dealt with in front of the entire church body. Um, but I think kind of the, the, the principle here maybe might be uh, something to the effect of the more public the, the, the sin and the, the more people who know about it, maybe the more clear the discipline needs to be, right? Um, and I'm sure Paul was, Paul was, he was definitely not unaware of Jesus' words in, in Matthew chapter 18 about how to settle conflict among believers. Um, you guys are familiar with that. You go to the person one-on-one. -on -one. If they don't listen, you bring another believer with you. If they still don't listen, then you bring it to um, the congregation. You bring it to the church. Um, Paul wasn't unaware of this, but he was just saying, hey, it, it's already at this point. Everybody knows about it, and you're proud about it for that matter. And so discipline needs to happen. Discipline needs to take place here. Now, verse 5 is a little bit strange. So he says this, this is what's supposed to happen. It says you're supposed to excommunicate him. You're supposed to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to say, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Um, but I think the overarching idea here is that in the church body, in the body of Christ, in the church, um, is, is, is God's realm, kind of, on earth, right? Um, but in the world is Satan's domain. And so essentially what, what Paul, for a time, of course, um, but essentially what Paul is saying is, is put him out of the church, put him into Satan's domain, uh, and so that he will repent the destruction of the flesh and the end goal so that his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord, verse 5. And so that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the end goal here of discipline for repentance. Now, Paul is clearly calling the Corinthian church to do something that is not easy, right? Um, many of them probably knew this person. They're probably friends with this person, um, maybe grew up with this person, right? Um, maybe they're neighbors and, you know, they, they, they share meals together, they, they do things together, they live life together, right? Um, this would not have been an easy thing to do. But when done in the proper way, this is less of a, a it's not a vindictive final act of, of punishment or final act of discipline by the church. It's actually, it's a loving, it's a loving act of correction. Because again, remember that the, the end goal of discipline is for repentance, and in fact, in this situation, we actually know that it was kind of a happy ending, and, and the end result that was desired is actually what happened. And if you look in the U version, I have um, the quote there from 2 Corinthians, so Paul's second letter um, to the Corinthians, at least the second letter that we have. Um, and he says in, in chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, he says, The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. And so if Paul is referring to this same person that he was, that he was saying, excommunicate from the church body. Um, so this was, this was a happy ending in, in this instance. This is the desired result of church discipline. It's not a, you're a sinner, you're doing something bad, we're kicking you out, don't come back. It's a, it's a, this is a disciplinary action. You can't enjoy the benefits of the body of Christ and continue to live in unrepentant and habitual sin. And so... You have to leave for a time until you come back repentant. And that's actually what happened here. Um, now, this is the desired result. It's not always what happens. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that many times church discipline is um, enacted and, and, and maybe it's enacted wrongly or it's not handled um, correctly and maybe people are hurt by that. Um, other times I'm sure church discipline is, is, is enacted and it's done to the best of everybody's abilities, but the people don't repent, right? Um, but that, this is the desired result. And so when looking at church discipline, we always have to keep in sight the goal. And the goal is for the repentance of, of, the, of the sinner. 
Um, and, and I think that this is, a lot of people have, have said, you know, this is really harsh. You know, what if, what if, you know, pushing somebody out of the church, you know, hurts their feelings and they're never going to come back or, you know, then they have a bad taste in their mouth from, you know, Christianity or whatever that is. Um, but I, I really think it's, it's pretty simple, you know. Um, when a parent disciplines a child, it's, it's to remove a bad behavior and, and enforce a good behavior, right? But if for you guys, if, if you were to cheat on every test and every homework assignment, um, and every quiz, and you never had a consequence for your actions, you'd probably never change, right? But if you were cheating on a, on a test, and you got caught, and, and you got suspended for a semester, when you came back, you probably wouldn't cheat on a test again, right? Or at least you'd be sneakier. That's not good. But you probably wouldn't cheat, right? right? The, the, the fact is, if, if, there's, if, there's no, if there's no consequences for actions, then it's affirming those actions, and so that's what Paul is saying here is that this person cannot be allowed to enjoy the benefits of the body of Christ, enjoy the benefits of being a believer, and also continue to live in habitual and unrepentant and also public sin. And so discipline for repentance. Um, for, for our application tonight, I, since none of us are, are church elders and um, hopefully none of us are in this exact scenario where we need to have church discipline enacted upon us, um, I wanted to make, I wanted to focus in on, on one other aspect of, of these first um, couple verses um, for some practical application for us tonight. Um, have you guys ever heard of, of a bragamony? If, you, if you've heard of it, you've probably heard of it from me, um, or you probably at least know what I'm talking about. So a bragamony is a term that uh, we started calling um, people's testimonies that were like overly outrageous and overly gory in their details of like the sinful things that they had done, you know, before they were a Christian kind of a thing. Um, and at Bible college, you, you get a lot of testimonies of, you know, these crazy things. And, and essentially, it's, sometimes it starts to feel more like they're bragging about like their sinful life uh, than, than they actually are just telling like what God delivered them from, right? And so we started calling it a bragamony, and, and you know, people would, would be like, oh, yeah, you know, I held a gun to my friend's head, and I did this, and I did that, and I did so many of this, and so much of that. And it's like, whoa, man, you're getting really, like, specific here. It almost seems like you're proud of this, right? And so we started calling it a bragamony, and, and, and it reminded me of, of maybe how the Corinthians are here in this passage, right? Not only is there extremely horrible sexual immorality in their church, but they're proud of it. They're not ashamed. They're not sweeping it on the rug. They're not trying to cover up a scandal. And, and obviously, none of those things are, are good. All these things are bad. Um, but, but worse, somehow, is they're actually proud that this is happening in their church. They've taken the freedom of Christ to such a far uh, perverted level that they think that you can do anything and still have grace cover you. And so there, it's a perversion of grace, and they're proud of it. And so I want to ask you guys tonight, are you proud of your sin? And that might sound like a pretty dumb question because you're instantly saying no. Of course not. But I think that a lot of us, we kind of have this bragamony in us sometimes, right? We, we talk about something that we did, you know, maybe you messed up with your significant other or, uh, or you went a little bit past tipsy when you were drinking the other night, right? And we, we, we're not ashamed of it. We talk about it, you know, because like, it's in the past, but, but we bring it up as if we're kind of bragging about it right? And sometimes it's almost like a, it's, it's either a normalization of sin so that we don't have to feel bad about what we did. And other times, you know, when I, when I hear people kind of brag about the sins that they used to commit or the sins that they just committed, um, other times it seems more like it's like trying to puff themselves up, kind of like the Corinthians here, and like saying, well, <laughs> you don't know what it's like out there in the world because I've really experienced it, you know? I know what it's like to do this or that, like, oh, you know, I, I don't, you know, I repented of that, but I know what it's like, and, and we brag about our sin. So I want to ask you guys, are you proud of your sin? When it comes up that you sinned, are, are you proud of it? Or are you, like the Corinthians, Paul said, ought you not rather to mourn? Are you proud of your ability to toe the line of sin? So our application tonight really is a lot more introspective than a um, go and do this. But I want to ask you guys to, to search your hearts and search your, your language. Um, are you proud of sin? Are you puffed up like the Corinthians? Moving on into our second point, um, which is become what you are. Become what you are. So verses 6 through 8, we read verse 6, it says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Uh, so, so what Paul is talking about here is yeast in bread, right? 
And it just takes a little bit of yeast to make the bread rise. You're familiar with that conf- uh, concept. So leaven, uh, leaven is yeast. And so he's saying just a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And so he's referring to just a little bit of sin pollutes the entire body, right? That's essentially what he's saying on here. And then in verse 7, he, he, he moves into actually a really beautiful illustration of, of Paul's theology of both justification and also sanctification. And so we'll move into this. It says, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. And so what Paul is talking about when he says you really are unleavened, he's saying you really are justified. And so what he's saying is you have been justified, you've been made pure through the sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ on behalf of your sins. And so from an eternal perspective, as believers, we've been made pure before Christ. But he says, before this, he says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. So essentially what he's saying is take sin out of your life and be pure as you have already been made pure before God. So become what you are. You see, we've been justified through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but we still live in a sinful world, right? We still make mistakes. And so the process of sanctification is our slow, gradual um, journey as we become more and more like Christ in this life. And the process of sanctification leads us to and prepares us for heaven and our future glorification eternally with Christ. And so it's really cool here what Paul is saying. He's saying, get the sin out of your life. Be pure as you have already been made pure. And this is the call to the Corinthian church as a whole. Be pure as you have already been made pure before Christ eternally. But it's also a call of the Bible to every believer today as well. You see, the process of sanctification is something that is ongoing. There's always going to be sin in our lives. There's always going to be seeds of sin trying to grow around in our lives. A little bit, right? A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. That's what Paul's saying here. And so this is a call for us as well to remove sin from our lives, to be pure as we have already been made pure. Become what you are, what you already are. Moving into verse, uh, or the end of verse 7, it says, For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul moves into this illustration of Passover. Um, so in, Pas- in Passover, the Jews were actually commanded in Deuteronomical law to, um, to light, light a candle um, and, and search their house the night before Passover. And they're supposed to search high and low, search everywhere, and get rid of everything that had yeast in it, everything that had leaven in it. And so this was part of their way to, to cleanse their house, essentially, sim- sim- symbolically, um, and remove anything that could contain yeast. And so what Paul is saying here is he's saying, let us also, as Christians, celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, not with sin, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so Paul is, is using this illustration to show that, that not only does the church sometimes need to be purified, but also we need to search out our own lives. We need to light a candle and search out our own lives and get rid of the sin in our lives. Because if we're going to become what we already are, we have to get sin out of our lives. And so Paul uses this, this analogy, and I, I, think it's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, now, obviously, Paul isn't calling for a witch hunt here, um, but he is commanding the church to be pure, to get rid of sin, both on an individual basis and um, as a community basis. And so in this way, uh, one of the commentators that I read, uh, Leon Morris, he referred to this as the Christian life is a constant celebration of the festival of Passover. And that kind of sounds pretty fun, constant celebration of a festival. Really, it's probably not quite as fun. Removing sin from our lives is, is usually not fun until, you know, after the fact, right? Uh, because it, it involves uh, change, right? It involves uh, sacrifice. It involves discipline. Um, how many of you guys have a 4.0 right now? Go ahead, raise your hands if you want to. All right, so all of you who are looking around and you're, you're mad at those people, Paul also has words uh, about r- malice, uh, anger, and hate, so you guys should read those too. Um, but everybody here knows the concept of trying to keep a high GPA, right? 
Or at least you understand the concept of when you get a bad grade, it, it, it hurts your GPA, right? Um, th that's the concept that Paul is saying here. You know, you could have a really good GPA, a really good GPA, and then you get, you know, you get a D, right? That's going to bring you down quite a bit. And, and you, you can't actually ever bring it back to, to 4.0, right? Um, but you understand that concept. And that's what Paul's saying here is a little bit of sin in our lives affects our entire lives. You know, I was, uh, I was reading, I'm reading this book right now. It's, it's, called, it's called Sacred Marriage. And the tagline is, what, what if marriage is designed to make us holy rather than to make us happy? Um, and I think the tagline is true. The answer is yes. Um, it is designed to make us holy. So spoiler alert, if you ever read the book, good book. Um, but as I was reading through the book, you know, I'm, I'm two years and a little more in, into, into marriage. And so I'm reading this book and, you know, he's bringing up examples of, of you know, these married couples that have like really big problems, you know, like really big, bad, deep-seated problems, issues, you know, leading to divorce. And so these different, um, these different illustrations and these different stories of, of people. And, uh, and, and I, I realized a couple chapters in, I kind of realized, I was like, man, uh, I, I keep reading this and just kind of skipping over and just thinking, man, I'm glad I don't have those problems, right? I'm glad my problems aren't that bad, right? And then I came to the realization of, well, you know, these people are 10, 15, 20 years into their marriages. What if the same seeds of sin have been sown in my life and they're progressing at the same point that those people's were, marriages were in their marriages two years in, right? And so I realized that, that a lot of times we like to look at these different sins that are listed in the Bible, right? You know, we, we see things like malice and hate and anger and sexual immorality and we think, oh, that's not me. Like, I don't do those things. I'm not that bad, right? But I think that we all have a little bit of some of these things in our lives, at least a little bit, right? And the seeds of sin are there, and they're growing at probably the same rate as the other big sins that you see. And it, it took a while to get to that point, too. And so for our application for this point, become what you are, I want to challenge you guys to search out, to search your lives, um, I put on the U version a, a, a verse from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Um, I won't read it, but there, there's a lot of passages like it. It's, it's lists of basically, hey, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Christians, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Do this, do this, do this, do this, right? All throughout the New Testament, there's lots of lists like that. And so I want to challenge you guys to read those lists and don't just skip over them like I was doing in the first couple chapters of that marriage book. Don't just skip over them. Actually ponder each one. What, what little bits of sin for, for greed do you have in your life? What little bits of sin do you have for sexual immorality in your life? What little bits of hate and malice and anger and all of these things that we're not supposed to have as Christians do you have in your life right now? So I want to challenge you guys to, to search your life, read some of these lists, look into these things, think about these things that we should be and should not be as believers. Moving into our third point for the night is verse 9, clearing up a matter of confusion. I put on the U version to judge or not to judge, just because I kind of thought it was funny. Um, but you'll see what I'm talking about. In verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers and idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging others, or judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. So in this section here, um, Paul, Paul clears up a matter of confusion, which um, he refers to a letter that he had written to them earlier, um, in, in verse 9, we don't have that letter. That would be, I guess, the, first tr the, the true 1 Corinthians, but we don't have that letter. But he refers to that, and he's kind of clearing up this matter and making a clarification here. And he says, essentially, he's saying, you are supposed to judge those inside the church, not those outside the church. You've got it all mixed up, right? And then he ends with his final statement of purge the evil one from among you. This church discipline still needs to happen. Um, and I was thinking, you know, to judge, not to judge. If this passage was applied correctly, I, I think it would it would do the church a lot of good, right? We'd get rid of some of the, the, the really like, small percent of really loud Christians who just want to yell at people and tell them that they're all sinners and stuff um, and then not focus on the other side of the gospel, right? 
And then we'd also kind of clear up this misconception within the church of the fact that, like, you know, we can't judge other, other people. We can't, like, call other people out for our sin because, or their sin because it's only between them and God, right? And I, I think we have this kind of mentality among us that, of kind of baby Christians. You know, we, we get mad if somebody calls us out for something, and, and we're too scared to call somebody else out for something, even in love. And so uh, this passage applied would probably do us a lot of good. But looking at verse 11, it says, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not to even eat with such a one. Um, so, so Paul clarifies what he meant here pretty clearly. And what, what this boils down to is that the, the church cannot allow fellowship for members who are engaging in unrepentant, habitual uh, sin. And, and, uh, and even, even including to the point of, in ancient times, eating a meal together was a pretty intimate act. It was a very, it was a very important part of fellowship and friendship. Um, and, and he says, do not even eat with such a one. Um, now, now we, know that, we know that Jesus ate with sinners, right? Um, Paul later on in this book says, uh, deems it okay to, to eat um, a meal at unbelievers' houses. And so that's, this isn't what Paul is saying. He's not saying don't eat with people who are sinning. But what he's saying is, those who are believers, those who are claiming to be Christians, those who are, are claiming the title of brother or sister in Jesus Christ, cannot be allowed to continue sinning unrepentantly, habitually, publicly, without any sort of correction, right? Because kind of like we talked about with like the discipline thing, if nothing is ever done, if nothing is ever said, it affirms those actions. And Paul is saying, this can't happen. Don't even eat with this person. He's not saying don't associate with unbelievers. Don't, he's not saying not to associate with, with people um, who are outside of the church. In fact, that would be completely opposite of most of the rest of the New Testament. And so in, in closing of this chapter, I want to ask you all to do a couple things. Um, first, this passage isn't preached on a lot in churches. And so first thing I want to ask you guys is when you go out and when you graduate and you become involved in a church and, you know, a couple years down the road, when, when, when you become leaders in churches, um, know that this passage is here, along with Matthew chapter 18, and know that, that a solemn duty of yours might be to enact church discipline. Um, and so know, know that that's a thing, and know that of what you're, what you're getting into if you accept church leadership. Um, but second, I want to ask you guys not to let sin to get to this point. So that this person who, is, who has his father's wife, um, there were probably some warning signs, right? There was probably like an initial maybe moment or initial time before it became a routine and before it became public. So I want to ask you guys, don't let sin get to this point, not in your life, not in the lives of others. James chapter 5, verses 20 through 21 says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So guys, this, this act of coming to a brother or sister in Christ in love, it's not, a, it's not a petty thing. It's not something to be taken lightly. James says, if someone is wandering from the truth and you bring him back, you're saving their soul. That's the importance of this, this, this discussion here. And so with this, I want to challenge you guys to do two things. If a brother or sister in Christ comes to you um, and, and, and approaches you about sin in your life, don't get mad. You're going to want to get mad. That's going to be your first inclination is, you know, self-righteous, like, no, that's actually not the case. Don't get mad. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, realize that, that they, don't, they probably don't want to have this conversation any more than you do, right? Um, and accept it as a, token, as a token of love, not as an attack, as a token of love by the person who brought it up to you. Um, and, and second, if your brother or sister in Christ is sinning, approach them in love. Have a conversation about it. Bring them back to the truth, as Paul says. Um, this should probably be a lot more of a normal thing among, among the believers, among the body of Christ. Um, we should be able to have these conversations with each other. Um, hey, you know, I've, I noticed this. I feel like, I feel like, you know, this might not, this might not be, this might not be right. I feel like this might be leading you down a bad path. Like, let's talk about it, like in love. And so, I, I want to challenge you guys to do these things. And and I want to end with with this this verse from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter ten, it says, 
And let us now consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for all of the many blessings that you've given us. We thank you for um, sending your son to die for us on the cross. God, we come to you now and we ask you to, to be in our hearts and be in our minds on this topic of, of church discipline. And, and, and God, I pray that, that you would give us the ability and give us the courage and the wisdom to, to know when somebody is coming to us out of love and, 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 and be able to accept that and be able to remove sin from our lives, God. I pray that the, the, the opposite would also be true. And God, I pray ultimately that, that we wouldn't let sin get to this point in our brothers' and sisters' lives or in our lives as well and that we would be the church that you have already made us to be, pure and righteous. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.